Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. We're very excited about what we uh, have to present to you and a, a bit of an announcement at the end, which uh, Rebecca is going to tell you about, so you have to wait to the end to hear about that. Uh, but uh, if you uh, read the announcements, the title of this presentation is Going for Gold. And we called it Going for Gold because uh, last year uh, the Sexual Behaviors Clinic won the American Psychiatric Association's Gold Award. So I just want to start off by telling you a little bit about this. Um, I first heard about the uh, Gold Award about uh, 30 years ago. Uh, when I was a resident at uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. And uh, you've probably heard about that hospital. It's one of the greatest hospitals in North America and, and the world. It's famous for a number of things, but uh, Sir William Osler, who's considered the grandfather of modern medicine, uh, was one of the founding uh, physicians at that hospital. And, uh, you know, he was ahead of his time. Um, at that time, he said that research was uh, essential to good clinical care and, uh, you know, encouraged uh, all physicians to, um, you know, question what the dogma of the day was and look uh, towards uh, new things. So I was at uh, Hopkins uh, um, studying uh, when one day there was an announcement that uh, the uh, uh, part of the psychiatric program, the uh, community psychiatry program, had won the gold award at the American Psychiatric Association. So of course I, I said, so you know, what, what's the big deal? And I was explain, it was explained to me that this was the uh, top award that, uh, that's available uh, to psychiatric departments um, in North America. And at the time, uh, you know, uh, the um, community psychiatry program was run by a person by the name of Bill Brakey, and I was working in that department at the time uh, in that uh, in that program. And uh, you know, when you're in a program, you often aren't aware of, of what the program is actually doing. But uh, we were, uh, I realized at that time, doing things that no one else had thought about uh, for the next 15 years. Uh, we were actually uh, leaving the hospital and going into the projects and uh, actually uh, taking psychiatry right uh, you know, to where the uh, mentally ill uh, people were. Uh, we were really doing what became ACT teams, uh, as I said, about 15 years ahead of time. Uh, also in the program was a, a psychiatrist named Bruno Lima who was a person who, if you worked with him as a, as a resident, you learned that you should first open the paper in the morning and read uh, looking for any natural disasters or uh, other uh, wars or outbreaks that had happened around the world because his specialty was not only going into communities, uh, but going into communities which had literally blown up uh, so he would be the first and uh, one of the first responders in at earthquakes or at floods or uh, in war zones, and he developed a method of uh, um, providing psychiatric care and uh, mental health support to people that were in the middle of crises. And uh, so I realized at that time that uh, the program that I, that I had been working in and thinking this was normal. Uh, was actually a very special one, uh, and that's why it won the uh, the gold award. So um, it's a pro. It's an award that I always thought uh, I would like to be part of another program that would get, and so uh, I was very pleased when last year uh, we were informed that uh, the APA had selected our program uh, to receive the award and. It's not only is it a, uh, the top award, it's also one that is not just handed out. Uh, you actually have, a, we actually had an external uh, site visit and uh, competed against, we're told over a thousand other programs in North America uh, in psychiatry, uh, only ones that are academic and outpatient. Uh, and we uh, turned out to be the, the top award. And uh, last year, um, uh, Lisa and I went to New York uh, where we were um, presented with the award and, uh, and, uh, and the biggest plaque that they gave out. And uh, so we were very happy to get that. So uh, you may, m must be wondering yourselves, so well, what's great about our program? And uh, you're now going to hear a little bit about what we are doing and what we plan to do 
over the next hour and a half, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. So I'm going to start off with Natasha Knack. All right, so before we actually get into talking about the Sexual Behaviors Clinic and all the wonderful things that it does, I want to give you a bit of an overview about some myths and realities about people who commit sexual offenses. Um, and part of the reason that this is important is because a lot of things that we do that work so well, we do because we're using the reality rather than the myth. And so, so many people are acting based on these myths, and that's obviously problematic. So, the first myth we're going to talk about is the fact that all pedophiles are child molesters. Um, and we see this coming up over and over again in the media, whether it be television, movies, newspapers, social media, we see these two terms being used interchangeably, despite the fact that they are not actually the same thing. Um, so you can see from this picture that I found here that despite the fact that they're not the same thing, the term pedophile is often associated with words like danger, crime, criminal, violence. But in reality, Sexual interests are different than sexual behaviors, and pedophilia is a psychiatric disorder with specific diagnostic criteria. So there's a manual called the DSM, and within there it specifies what these criteria are. So they include a persistent sexual interest in prepubescent children, so that's for six months or more, and having either acted on the interest or suffering distress because of it. So this is really important. Even the diagnostic manual points out that you don't have to have acted on this interest in order to be diagnosed. In contrast, a child molester is someone who has sexually abused a child, but who may or may not actually have pedophilia. So, research has actually found that approximately 50% of child molesters would actually not meet these criteria for pedophilia, which means this other 50% are offending for some other reason. So, that may cause you to wonder, why would someone without pedophilia ever sexually abuse a child? And this leads us nicely into our next myth, which is that sex offenses are always sexually motivated. I included some cartoons because it's a bit of a heavy topic and hopefully this will, you know, lighten it up a bit. Um, so one of the reasons that people seem to think this is because, you know, logically it makes a little bit of sense. If you're doing a sexual action, it makes sense that there's a sexual motivation behind it. But from talking to patients in the clinic, what we've actually found out is there's a lot more that goes into it than just sexual interest. So because we kept hearing that, we decided to do some research because that's what we do. Um, so we conducted two studies, one with um, child molesters and one with child pornography offenders. And what we did is we interviewed them to try and determine what they thought their motivation for offending was. So we used a type of interview that has very open-ended questions which allows people to really talk freely and openly about their experiences and their thoughts rather than sort of guiding them into any particular direction. Um, and then what we do with those interviews is we go through and we analyze them and we look for themes that come up consistently throughout the interviews. And what we found is that there are really multiple motivations for offending. So one of the things is that, before I get into this, I want to give you a few caveats. Um, one of the things that always comes up when I present this, I want to make sure everyone is aware that these are explanations and not excuses or justifications. And that's not me saying that, that's actually the participants themselves. Um, a lot of the people I interview are very adamant about the fact that they want me to know that they are not making excuses or trying to justify what they've done. They are simply trying to understand themselves what happened and explain it. Um, so that's really something to keep in mind. And importantly, the reason that we do this type of research is not to try and justify these excuses or justify these offenses or make them seem acceptable because they're obviously not. We do it because it's really hard to prevent someone from doing something again if you don't know why they did it in the first place. So, um, when I go through, I'm going to give you a little snippet of sort of the results that we found here, but I want you to keep something in mind. Um, it's going to be probably difficult to relate to some of the motivations that I'm talking about. Um, and that's not surprising. And interestingly, a lot of the people that I interview when they're sitting across from me also mention that they look back on the things that they've done and have a hard time understanding it as well. And the reason for that is because a lot of people who commit sexual offenses are suffering from cognitive distortions. So these are irrational thoughts or beliefs that interfere with the way that we perceive reality and can convince us of things that aren't actually true. So as we go through um, these little snippets of motivation, sort of keep that in the back of your head. So what we found is that offenders and child molesters had a few unique motivations for offending. Um, within the child pornography offenders, one was this idea of avoiding reality. And these were people who were looking at this material as almost an escape mechanism, trying to avoid the problems and stresses that they were having in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and this would be sometimes, you know, six, seven, eight hours in a day. 
And for a lot of those people, part of what was exciting was more the search rather than looking at the actual material. Um, and it seemed for some that they, were getting, they weren't getting a sense of achievement in their lives other places, and that this was some way that they could feel like you know, finding that next thing was some sort of accomplishment. Um, another was this idea of developing an interest. So these are people who thought they didn't have a sexual interest in children before having seen any type of child pornography, but what they were interested in was porn that was taboo. So they started out looking at normal porn and it got a little boring, so they moved on to something a little more taboo. After a while, that got a little boring too, and this continued until they ended up looking at child pornography. And now, since there's really nothing more taboo than child pornography, that's where they stopped, and by continuing to look at this material, they felt that they actually developed an interest in children. Now looking at the child molester sample, one of the motivations that came up was this idea of seeking intimacy. So these were people who tended to have difficulties establishing relationships with age-appropriate partners for numerous reasons, whether it be mental health issues or um, anxiety, social phobias, or in some cases they were people who, as children, were very badly bullied and because of that, they became really uncomfortable with their own peer group and became much more comfortable with people younger than them. And this continued into their adulthood so that they felt much more comfortable around children and that's why they sought intimacy there rather than with age-appropriate partners. And then finally, a lack of sexual information. So I say this one for last because I think it's really important, especially with the new sexual education curriculum that's come out in the last year or so and all the controversy that surrounded that. Um, so one of the things we found is that children who lacked sexual information were actually more likely to be victimized. And this was because children who were naive about sex seemed to be less likely to either know something inappropriate had happened or less likely to report it to somebody. Um, on the flip side, offenders themselves also found that growing up they lacked sexual information or they had bad information that they were getting either from their friends or from TV and they grew up and no one ever interceded to sort of correct this bad information and so they ended up acting on this by offending. Um, so that makes me think that, you know, nowadays if, if a parent or the school is not talking to a child about sex, they will find that information elsewhere. And nowadays, unfortunately, where they're going to find it is probably on the internet. <coughs> Excuse me, it's probably on the internet, which is obviously not where we want them to be learning this information. So just something to keep in mind with this whole controversy about the sexual education curriculum. Um, and then unsurprisingly, one motivation that we found was true in both groups was sexual gratification. So this leads us into our next myth, which is that sexual interests can't be changed. Um, and there's a couple of reasons that people may think this. Um, one of the things is that there may be this confusion between sexual interest and sexual orientation. So here in our clinic, we believe that pedophilia is a sexual interest, not a sexual orientation. Uh, and the DSM, the manual that I mentioned earlier, supports this as well, because when they put out their most recent version, there was something in there that actually referred to pedophilia as a sexual orientation, and the committee from the DSM put out a notice saying that was an error, that was incorrect, and it would be fixed in future printings. So they themselves are saying that this is an interest and not an orientation. So what's the difference? Well, a sexual interest is who or what turns you on, gets you going, who you want to have sex with. It's about sex. Sexual orientation, despite the fact that it has sex in the title, is really more about who you fall in love with. It's about who you want to come home to at night, who you want to cuddle up with on the couch, and who you want to fall asleep beside. And so naturally, you know, if your orientation is towards males, let's say, there's a good chance you will also have a sexual interest in males. But it's not required. So think about this as an example. If you have a gay couple, who one day they decide to stop having sex. Are they any less gay than they were the day before? Probably not. All right, so in reality, the brain can and does change. Um, so another reason that people may have thought that sexual interest can't be changed is for a long time we thought that at a certain age the brain lost its ability to change. Neuroplasticity is the capacity of the brain to develop and change throughout life, something Western science once thought impossible. And some of the reasons it was thought that this was impossible was because it was previously believed that the brain could not generate new neurons, meaning that you were born with a certain amount and that's all you got until you died, and that the ability to create new neural pathways, which are the connections in our brain that form in response to sort of learning new things and new situations, um, declined around age 20 and stopped by age 40. But luckily for all of us, uh, more modern research has shown that neuroplasticity actually lasts a lifetime. Um, so a psychiatrist, a Canadian psychiatrist actually, uh, Norman Doidge, wrote this book called The Brain That Changes Itself. 
And in it, he discusses neuroplasticity and its relationship to various things. And one of the things he discusses is the relationship between neuroplasticity and sexual attraction. And he had this to say about sexual sadists. These men were able to change their sexual type because the same laws of neuroplasticity that allow us to acquire problematic tastes also allow us to acquire newer, healthier ones. It's a use it or lose it brain, even where sexual desire and love are concerned. Um, another book called My Stroke of Insight um, was by a brain scientist who herself had a stroke that shut down the entire language center of her brain. Then she spent the next eight years rebuilding and recovering um, to the point where she had rebuilt the entire language center of her brain was able to go on to write this book and is now an inspirational speaker. Um, she actually has a really amazing TED talk, which was apparently the first to ever go viral on the internet. Uh, and she had these things to say in her book. Scientists are well aware that the brain has tremendous ability to change its connections based upon incoming stimulation. And as a trained neuroanatomist, I believe in the plasticity of my brain, its ability to repair, replace, and retrain its neural circuitry. So the question is then, if we're able to change our brains, why can't we change our sexual interests? Um, now here's the thing, so there are some programs out there that have the motto that, you know, we can treat you and we can stop you from ever offending, but we can't actually change your sexual interest, that's not possible. So, you know, think about that. If you tell somebody that it's not possible to change their interest, you're also basically telling them that it's impossible for them to ever have a happy, healthy sex life, why would they even bother trying, you know? Um, but on the other hand, what we tell people is that change is possible. And even if we can't know that for 100% certainty, what's the worst thing that can happen from telling someone they could possibly change and get better and move on to have this happy, healthy sex life? Um, so Henry Ford's quote, I think, is super applicable. Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. Um, so that's why we take the approach that change is possible. Um, so a lot of people, because they believe that all sexual offenses are sexually motivated and they believe that sexual interests can't change, believe that all sex offenders will eventually re-offend. Uh, another reason people tend to think this is because we only hear about those who do re-offend. Because of the stigma around sex offenders, you never hear about the people who get better and go on to leave happy, ha lead happy, healthy, pro-social lives. <clears throat> But in reality, recidivism rates are actually low. So recidivism means reoffending. Um, and this first study was a meta-analysis, which is basically a research technique that combines the results of a bunch of different independent studies. So this particular one reviewed 95 studies of recidivism, looking at over 30,000 sex offenders followed up for five to six years. And what they found was that for sexual reoffending, less than 15% reoffended during this time period. And this is actually a bit of a higher estimate, and you have to consider that this includes uh, people who were treated and untreated, which is obviously going to make that number a little bit higher than it would be if you were just looking at a treated sample. Um, now let's compare this to some other recidivism rates. So the Bureau of Justice Statistics looked at over 400,000 offenders from 30 different states with a follow-up of five years, and look at the reoffense rates they found for property offenses, public order offenses, and violent offenses. Almost twice, or well, and then you look at the sex offender group. For any type of recidivism within the sex offender group, it was almost half as much as re sorry recidivism within these other types. So property offenders, public orders offenders, violent orders, violent offenders. Uh, another meta-analysis reviewed 10 studies with almost 5,000 offenders from Canada, the US, and England, and they used three different follow-up periods, so 5, 10, and 15 years. And what they found was even after 15 years, less than a quarter of the entire sample had ended up reoffending. Uh, additionally, in 2014, the rate of sexual assault declined 3% from the previous year. 98% of sexual assaults were classified as level 1, which is the least severe type and aggravated sexual assault, which is the most severe type, actually had the greatest decline. So there's this other myth that comes up that, well, the reason sex offenders are all going to reoffend eventually is because they're ticking time bombs, meaning that the longer they go without reoffending, the more they're going to be pent up and eventually burst. Um, the research does not support this at all. Um, so this study from 2014 looked at 21 recidivism studies with over 7,700 sex offenders, and this data here is following them up for 10 years. And so just to explain a little bit, um, the first column there, I don't have a laser pointer, but the first column there is a follow-up of 10 years from the time they were released. The second fall or column is 10 years follow-up after they had been in the community for five years offense-free, so a total of 15 years follow-up. And then the third is a 10-year follow-up after being in the community offense-free for 10 years, so that's a 20-year follow-up. And what we see is that recidivism rates are highest during the first few years after release, 
but that after this 10 years offense free and a follow, another 10 year follow up, less than 5% ended up reoffending of the total sample. So that includes low risk, moderate risk, and high risk sex offenders. I'm going to go a little bit over time. <laughs> um, and this effect was especially prominent for the high risk sex offender group. So as you can see, the likelihood of reoffending was cut approximately in half for every five years that the person spent offense free in the community. So in reality, the longer sex offenders go without reoffending, the less likely they are to ever reoffend. The next myth is that treatment costs are too high, um, which is very interesting if you consider that keeping one inmate in federal prison for a year costs over $117,000. Um, so the Bath Institute did a cost-benefit analysis of their treatment program. They treated 60 people a year. They expected about 10 people to fail by reoffending. They found that on average about two people reoffended per year, which meant eight uh, less reoffenses every year. So it cost $205,000 to treat 60 offenders for one year, and for each person who reoffended, it cost $200,000. So. If we're preventing eight people from reoffending a year at $200,000, that's 1.6 million. Now we minus the program cost of 205,000, and you're left with $1.4 million in savings per year just from this one treatment program. And even more importantly, that is on top of the benefit of saving children from being abused. Uh, the next is that you know people will say, well, even if we can afford it, it doesn't matter because sex offenders won't willingly seek treatment. Um, and what we know is that preventative treatment is actually increasing. There's the Stop It Now program, which is a phone helpline that offers support to people with a sexual interest in children. There's Prevention Pro Project Dunkelfeld, which is a project in Germany that put out advertisements encouraging people to come into treatment before they had offended. And of course, at the Sexual Behaviors Clinic here, um, we accept people who have never offended but who are referring into treatment because they know that they have a problematic sexual interest that they don't want to act on. Uh, and because we saw more of this, we actually did a study where we asked these individuals, you know, what happened between realizing you had this interest and now? And what they mentioned is that, you know, many of them knew they had this interest for quite a while, but they didn't seek out help for a number of reasons, including feelings of shame made it difficult to tell anyone, they had a bad reaction the first time they told someone, they were unaware that treatment existed or couldn't access it for whatever reason, they feared being arrested for their sexual thoughts, even if they hadn't acted on them, and they did not believe they could be helped. Now, I really want to point out it's important is a lot of these reasons have more to do with society and the society that we've created than with the individual. So because we're so afraid to talk about pedophilia, a lot of misunderstandings are out there. And misunderstandings lead to stigma. And stigma creates an environment in which these people who all they want to do is get help for an interest that they didn't ask for, prevents them from coming in and getting the help that they need. So really, as a society, that's sort of us failing them, you know, not to mention failing the children that might be offended against if this person actually goes on to reoffend. So something to keep in mind, um, we're really working towards this idea of seeing pedophilia as a public health issue, um, one that deserves intervention and treatment just like any other mental health issue, rather than waiting until this person goes on to offend and then responding as a criminal justice issue. Seems a little backwards when we, mo when we know preventative treatment is possible and it works. Um, I'm going to sort of rush through a little because I know I'm over time already. Um, these are some quotes from the motivation study that I mentioned earlier. And even though we didn't specifically ask about treatment, it came up over and over again that people were very grateful that they were here. Um, so one person said, I thought, I'll never change, I'm too old to change. But I realize now you're never too old to change. One can change if one has the desire to change. Also, I'm very happy I got caught. I've learned a lot and I was able to get the help that I needed. To have had to face the legal system and the full responsibility of my actions has made me really aware that this is something I have to work hard on, and I'm glad I did. And finally, you've got to have some kind of positive feedback. Not positive about what you did, but positive about what you can do. You need to feel that you're a human being, that you're a person, that you can do something with your life. All right, so then people will say, well, even if we can afford it, and even if people want it, it doesn't matter because treatment for sex offenders doesn't work. And, uh, again, there's a number of reasons people might think this. One is that for many years, a lot of treatment programs used one-size-fits-all treatments. And as we know, this is a really diverse group of people, and so you can't expect using one treatment for everyone to be effective. Um, another problem is that a lot of treatment programs actually are not targeting factors directly related to reoffending. 
And the best example of this is empathy training, um, which about 90% of sex offender treatment programs involve this aspect of empathy training, despite the fact that research has shown numerous times that empathy is not actually related to sexual recidivism, most likely because sex offenders are not actually devoid of empathy. Um, so, thankfully, in reality, sex offender treatment reduces recidivism. And I could go on for this about days, but again, I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, the Workworth Institution is a federal penitentiary, so they were evaluating their treatment program. They looked at 468 treated sex offenders who were medium to high risk and followed them up for five years. And these expected recidivism rates here are based on a couple risk assessments that are used, so the Static 99 and the LSI are two risk assessments. And based on those, the expected recidivism rate in this population should have been 18%. And what they found was, in reality, only 11.3% ended up reoffending. Another study by the Bath Institution, which is another federal penitentiary, looked at 534 treated sex offenders, meeting them to high risk, and 5.4 year follow-up. And again, they found that for both sexual and general recidivism, um, the treated group here um, was significantly lower than the expected rates of recidivism. This is a study by the National Sex Offender of the National Sex Offender Program. They had 347 treated sex offenders and a control group of 137 untreated. So two years is a bit of a shorter follow-up, but nonetheless they found that for sexual, violent, and any recidivism, the treated group was significantly lower than the untreated group. But going back to this fact that sex offenders, you know, in general recidivism rates are low, even the untreated group reoffended at less than 5%. And then this is a really great meta-analysis, probably one of the best on recidivism. They looked at over 9,000 treated sex offenders and over 12,000 untreated and followed them up for an average of five years. And again, they found that for sexual, violent, or any type of recidivism, the treated group was again significantly lower than the untreated group. But again, even the untreated group in this very large sample was under 20%. Um, the one important thing to make note of here is that only programs designed specifically for sex offenders were found to be effective. And so that's one of the reasons these myths are so important, is that we really need to understand this population if we're going to be able to create treatment programs that are going to be effective. And then finally, my last slide here is our sexual behaviors clinic here at the Royal. So you're going to hear a lot more about this in the next little bit, but we see approximately 200 new patients a year. We use individual pharmacological and group therapies, and we're multidisciplinary, meaning that we refer to other um, allied health staff, like social workers, occupational therapists, things like that. So you're going to hear lots more about that, but you want to know, probably, is, but does it work? Well, of all the patients seen in the SBC since 2001, the number of known hands-on sexual reconvictions against children is zero. And so now, I am going to let the rest of these lovely ladies tell you uh, how we did that, how that was possible. So, thanks for listening. Okay, so I believe our team was in Vienna when we got the call that we uh, had made the top six finalists um, for the APA Gold Award, and we were ecstatic. Um, we actually, the day after I got back um, from Europe, we sat down for our independent review, um, and, and it went really well. We felt good about it. You know, we talk, there was six, so we had to beat out three to be in the top three, and I said to our group, I, I think we could beat out the top three. Never did we really think that all of a sudden we'd get this call and we'd be number one, that we got the gold award. And um, I remember Paul called us into his office one morning and he was all excited, but like kind of secretive. And he's like, I need you guys to come over at a certain time. There's something I want to show you. And so he pulls us into the office and uh, he says to us, uh, I got this voicemail on the weekend. I just, I want to play it for you guys and just see what you guys think. Um, so we're all just sitting there listening. So he hits play and um, this woman comes on and she's speaking so slow. And I'm from the American Psychiatric Association. And we're like, okay. And she's so monotone and so like, blah. And I'm like, oh no, we didn't get it, we didn't get it. I just wanted to tell you that you were successful in getting the gold award. Well, I don't think anybody heard anything after but what she said after that, because I was just screaming with excitement. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it's very, a very exciting moment um, for us, for sure. And uh, so yeah, so that's one of our funny stories about uh, the experience. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about the lab. So I take care of the lab, um, which is on the clinical side. Um, one of the reasons that uh, the SBC stood out um, for the APA um, was the fact that we are so deeply rooted in clinical research. 
So our core team is made up of a group of researchers and a group of clinicians. So we have that good mesh, which I think is really important. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the clinical research and Rebecca will do a little bit more about that. Um, but I'm generally just gonna start off with the lab and then talk a little bit about our, in, our uh, international collaborations. So what is the SBC? So although we're a clinic that functions um, generally within like the uh, eastern part of Ontario, um, we also see patients across Canada and we see patients that actually come up from the United States for assessments as well. Um, so who is it that we see? Who's being referred? Um, we see people at all stages of the criminal justice system. So for example, if a person is uh, first arrested, their, loyalist, their lawyer will say, okay, let's get you in and um, we'll get you in for an assessment and get you into treatment. Um, if they've been convicted, uh, the judge will send them for an assessment prior to treatment. Um, and then if they're, once they've served their sentence and released into the community, we see people as well that are serving probation and parole, or working with probation and parole. Um, we also see individuals that have never acted on any interest. So someone, uh, patients come in, for example, that may have um, an interest in children that have never acted on it. And we're actually seeing an increase in this group. So people that come in and say, listen, I have this interest in children. I don't want to have this interest. I want help. I've never acted on it. I want help. I, like, I, I want to be able to have a, a relationship with an adult woman and, and enjoy it. Um, and we're seeing that, that, that group grow, which is exactly what we want to see, right? Because then we're able to get these individuals into treatment prior to them going on to commit an offense. We also see individuals that have interests that there's no questions of legality. To some, it may seem odd particular fetishes or different interests like that. Um, but for, for them, it's causing them clinical concern. You know, they come in and say, okay, I'm having this particular sexual interest. My wife tolerated it for a while, but now she's like, nope, I don't want you to use it at all in the bedroom. Um, and it's causing problems in our marriage. You know, I can't stop thinking about it. And I love my wife, I wanna fix our marriage, but I, you know, we need help here. Um, so we see these types of individuals as well. And that's where we see, too, the difference between clinically concerning, uh, deviant, and illegal, right? So really, we have the whole range of patients coming. Uh, so what do, our, what do our patients look like? Generally, we see men, but we're seeing an increase in women. Um, huge age range. Um, so as youngest of 12, high, oldest of being 86, um, and generally, like, moderately educated. Um, so people that come in, what is their reason for uh, presenting um, for assessment and treatment? Uh, the primary reason is something to do with children. So essentially they have some sort of, oh, it's not a red dot, that's gonna be annoying. So the two really big ones, <laughs> Um, um, so any, essentially anything to do with question of interest in children, whether it be um, a pedophilia or incest. Obviously though you also see there's a whole gamut, there's a wide range of different potential interests. Um, I really like this slide because it shows that we've really been seeing an increase in child pornography offenses. Um, so this has definitely been on the rise. And the last um, two years, so it was up to 2013, and my estimate for 2014, 2015 is it just, it gets continued to grow. In fact, I'd say high teens, maybe upwards of potentially 20% of, of patients that we get referred are for child pornography offenses. Um, and the majority of those individuals are, have, have only committed child, child pornography offenses, so they don't also have contact offenses as well, but just strictly ch child pornography. Um, so we see men, women, adolescents. Um, and then so what happens is they come in, they go and they see the doctor and the doctor will decide, um, okay, maybe I think you know, an assessment battery would be helpful for me to decide exactly where they're at and understand better where this individual is. So our test, typical testing battery includes a, uh, um, a, a big uh, like package, psycholo psychology package that we use that looks at things like aggression, substance abuse, impulsivity, um, cognitive distortions, which, which Natasha talked to you about today. Um, we also do blood work, which makes sense because we're, we're dealing with psychiatrists here, right? And so we look at essentially sex hormones. So things that uh, may come into play when we're looking at different possible treatments. Um, we do a computer-based assessment that looks at cognitive, uh, cognitive assessment, so um, it looks at their, their psychological functioning and a, a diagnostic assessment as well. But the part people like to hear the most about, and this is what I'm going to talk the most about today, is phallometric assessments. So phallometrics is um, a measure, it's an objective measure of sexual arousal. So essentially what happens is a patient comes in and they put a ring, this is the ring that they put on their penis, and they sit in a room by themselves, it's very private, the lights are dimmed, and they're shown a series of different stimuli. And the machine measures their arousal to different types of stimuli. So stimuli is presented, we're measuring their arousal, and we present. We wait for a detumescence period, so a time in which they come back down to base, as we would say, and then we would present them another stimuli, and then we go from there. Um, so this is essentially what I see when we do the testing. Um, so. 
The blue line is their penis at flaccid. So we look at circumference, okay? So on the side, we have millimeters of stretch. Uh, the yellow line is any arousal. So typically what you would see at the beginning, um, unfortunately I don't have a photo of the beginning, but it's just a natural progression happening. Um, and then this was sort of just like the stability of an erection over time. So what we look at is uh, change, right? Change of millimeters of stretch. So anything over 1.5 millimeters um, is what we look at as, in clinically as well, what would be determined as being past significance. So just to give you an idea, currently, um, Phallometrics is the gold standard in terms of assessment of sexual arousal. Um, we're doing a lot of work in terms of investigating other potential um, uh, measures that may help to improve upon this. Um, but as of right now, this is something we use consistently and I test over, uh, say, 150 uh, new men a year, I think was the last estimate that we had. Um, and since, take, since uh, being in the lab, I think I've tested over 1,000 men. Um, so we definitely we see a lot of people uh, coming through. Um, so when we look at phallometrics, what stimuli are we showing them? Well, what is the material that we show them? In Canada, we're permitted to use um, nude photos of children for clinical purposes. So to, for assessment purposes, right? In the United States, they're not allowed. So they're much more restricted in what they're able to show for clinical purposes. So what we have is what we call, um, I, we start with a series of different videos. I call it my primer form, because what we know from the research is that individuals will respond the largest amount, so the largest magnitude, to video. So we have a video of two men, two women, and a man and a woman. And then we have a non-sexual um, video of children playing in a pool. So they're fully clothed. There's nothing overtly sexual about it, but the idea being that if somebody's truly pedophilic, they may be more likely to respond to this video. And then we're able to compare across the same type of stimuli. We also have the, series, the slide series. So male, female, adult, adolescent, older child, younger child. And then we also have neutral, so landscape photos. And the reason that we have those is because it allows us to um, be more confident in the fact that this individual is able to sexually discriminate between something that's actually sexual and a tree. Which, I mean, to some, maybe, maybe kind of sexual. Uh, but to the average person, not so much, right? So it gives us a better idea as to um, whether or not they're able to sexually discriminate. Um, we also have a broad range of different um, behavioral scenarios that are uh, done through audio. So a man speaks in a uh, monotone voice, um, and it's a second person narrative and just describes different sexual scenarios. Um, so the primary things that we look for in the audio scenarios are interest in rape and pedophilia. Um, so pedophilia, a heterosexual and homosexual pedophilia. Um, and then what we do is we create an index. So we look at their response to the more problematic or deviant stimuli and look at it, and look at it in comparison to their responding to the, the adult prosocial consenting stimuli. So one of the important things whenever patients come in is that I always try to stress is the importance of in informed consent. So every patient that comes in, we explain to them at any point if they want to stop testing or any type of, of, of the assessment or treatment, that's fine. If they don't want to be here, that's okay with us. Um, we'll be here when they're ready, you know? Um, so that's one of those things that they're always given an opportunity to walk away if they need to. If it's too much for them emotionally, that's okay. Um, one, another important thing to consider when we're looking at phallometrics is um, what the results should not be used for. So, although I joke that I'm a penis lie detector, um, phallometrics doesn't actually um, work as a um, determination of guilt or innocence. So if a person is alleged to have committed offense, if a person's alleged to have committed offense, it, and they come into the lab and they respond to uh, materials that have to do with children, in no way does it mean that they did what they are alleged to have done. All it does is it gives a doctor a better understanding as to where they are sexually, wh what their interest is, right? Um, anecdotally, a lot of my patients come in and, oh shoot, <laughs> a lot of my patients come in and, um, um, and, they, and they come in pretty nervous the first time and they're just like, okay, so I'm gonna sit in this room and you're gonna, you're gonna you know, measure my arousal like, and you're gonna sit in the other room and I'm supposed to get aroused to this? I'm, I'm feeling kind of nervous um, and that's okay. But the vast majority of times they come out and say, you know what, it actually wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be. It's kind of boring, but you know what, I got through and now it's good because the doctor and I can talk about the results and move forward with things. Um, so why do we do phallometrics? Aside from being an objective measure of arousal, what's really the main reasons? Um, so it gives us a general assessment of sexual interest, right? So not determinant of guilt or innocence, but really where does this person's interest lie? Uh, it also gives the doctors a baseline for treatment. So when they first come in and they're saying, yes, I, I have this interest in children, whether they want to have it or not, 
it gives us an idea as to, particularly within that interest, um, where, where their almost sub-interests lie. Does this person have more of a specific interest in uh, more course of uh, sexual encounters? Um, or is it the consenting element? Um, and so they're able to see that. Um, and that sort of leads into the measure of change and response over time. So a lot of times we'll have patients come in and they'll, they'll, they'll initially do the assessment and then six months, a year, two years down the line, they say to Dr. Federer, Dr. Federoff, hey doc, I'm feeling great. I don't have these interests at all anymore. My wife and I are having wonderful sex. I only think about her or adult women and I'm not thinking about children anymore. You know, I, I, I feel great, I think I'm cured, you know, or however they may describe it. Um, and what we do then is we bring them back into the lab and we test them. We're like, well, great, let's look at this like post-treatment effect, right? And that's exactly what we're seeing is an effect. So what we're seeing is um, patients will come in and, and their responses to the problematic or deviant stimuli is decreasing, <laughs> which, is, which is wonderful and what we want to see. But what's great is that we're also seeing a subsequent increase in the adult consenting material. So their sexual arousal to the adult material where they weren't really responding before, now there's an increase to that, which is great. So we actually uh, somewhat recently had written up the results um, for a study, a retrospect, retrospective study looking at that, and we're currently working on a, a prospective. So essentially where we're recruiting and doing testing new patients over a series of time to look for that effect again. Um, so there's a lot of fun things we've got going on in the lab. Um, um, specialized uh, stimuli, essentially we have a lot of patients that will come in with other interests that aren't interested in rape or, or, or pedophilia, right? And what we have to do is when we said, okay, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to test them on something? So we create more specialized stimuli when needed. Um, Multi-site standardization is another thing that we're focusing on uh, a lot right now within the lab. Um, one of the biggest criticisms of, um, of assessment labs throughout Canada and North America and the world is that there's a lack of standardization, uh, which is really problematic. Um, so we can have a lab, our lab here, come up with results and say Dr. Federoff's the expert for a defense of a defense and the Crown guy goes to KMH, which is in Toronto, and they have an assessment done there. Because it's different stimuli that they're using, it's possible they can come up with totally different results, right? So we're working towards multi-site standardization. Actually, our team is in the midst right now of putting together a uh, international course which will uh, pull together uh, experts on the topic from five key countries where all the great minds will get together and, and meet and discuss um, essentially moving forward and how to approach this issue and really what's the best way um, of assessing and how can we go forward and implement it. Because for years people have been talking about the fact that this needs to be changed, but so far it hasn't been done. So that's something that we're, it's my career pipe dream, but we're, we're working on it. Um, another thing that we do a lot of work with is international collaborations. Um, so we've been really lucky to link up with a lot of um, incredible people um, throughout uh, North America and, and Europe and actually even Russia. Uh, uh, Dr. Fedorov and I will be going to um, Moscow to put on a, a course in uh, uh, May. Um, course on the different things that we're doing within the clinic uh, with a group of other psychiatrists as well. So we've got that going on which is wonderful. Um, and then we've got a lot of different types of like sub research that clinical research that I was talking about before. So we really have that blend of the clinical element but researching you know, where things are playing with that. So we are doing work with uh, mobile avatars. So there's a group um, in Montreal and a group in Prague that we're doing work with right now where we're looking at the cre creation of, of mobile avatars. So these avatars that can move in sexual ways for assessment purposes. So although we're allowed to have the photos that I explained to you, they're very old. You know, I can't just call up the RCMP, even though I used to be part of the RCMP, and say, hey guys, I need new child pornography. So what we've done is um, we've looked at this idea of potentially using mobile avatars. So we'll have the same like age categories and male and female, and then you have this new child acting in a sexual way. Um, now, so instead of having still photos, now you have the mobile avatars that it can move, right? Um, Real Child Voice is another study that we're doing um, some work on with um, a group down in Charleston, South Carolina where essentially what's um, happened with that is they brought in uh, child actors to read non-sexual scripts and they spliced this audio and put it into adult child scenarios. So what was a scenario of a child and his birthday, you know, there's the cake, that's big, I like that. They spliced it and put it into a sexual scenario. Um, so what then we have is that adult child interaction. So it's very obvious what's going on, right? Um, so we're actually, we're presenting the results of that in Sweden um, this June. Um, so it's, it's, it's looking very, very promising, so that's great. We're also doing a lot of great work with the use of M fMRIs um, with our group in Charleston and our group in Prague, um, looking at um, phallometrics uh, combined with fMRIs. So looking at fMRIs as a measure of arousal that may be more accurate um, than strictly using phallometrics on its own. 
a change in deviant arousal patterns, which you've heard about. And we're also doing some work with eye tracking. So with eye tracking, the idea being that if you were sexually aroused or sexually attracted to the model, you're going to look longer and more frequently at the erogenous zones than if you were not to be sexually aroused or attracted to that person. Um, so that's the other thing we've got going on. The last thing I'll talk to you about today is our work with female patients. Um, we've been seeing more and more female patients coming in, and to be honest, right, right well, up until semi-recently, um, we've been pretty limited in terms of what we can do on the assessment side. Paul's great for his work in treatment of, of, of uh, females that have uh, paraphilic interest, but on the assessment side, we've really been limited. So we linked up with Cindy Messon, who's uh, done some incredible, Dr. Cindy Messon, who's done some incredible work in um, Austin, Texas, um, on vaginal photoplasmography. So I'm going to call it VPP, so we all don't like say that three times fast. Um, and essentially what it is, is it's loosely, it's, it's the female version of, of the measure of arousal that phallometrics would be, right? So this is what the device looks like. And instead of measuring increase in circumference of the penis, which we do with men, with women they insert, they insert the device and it sends out infrared signals and it measures increase in the magnitude of blood flow. So what we see, oh, I have to see how this doesn't work. Does it? So what we see is the pulse amplitude. So if you look at the second one, at the beginning, that's neutral stimuli. So what you see is the magnitude of the blood in the vaginal walls going boom, 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 boom. But as they become more aroused, the magnitude is increases. So um, to date, the, this area of research has re been really well developed in terms of general um, psychophys measures in women in a general group, but it, it, to date hasn't really ever been looked at in a forensic population. Um, so it's very limited in terms of being able to, able to um, see if women are able to sexually differentiate, which I talked about how men, that's what, for example, the neutrals versus the, uh, the more sexual scenarios. Um, that being said, work with Cindy is, is quite promising because we're, we're looking at potential that certain types of uh, statistical approaches will give us a better idea. So stay tuned, we will see. But the idea is if that does work out, then going forward, we will have um, a way to measure uh, females. We actually recently got a grant and very soon we'll be starting that study where we're testing females um, that have particular interests, uh, pedophilic interests and then our healthy controls to look at this to see uh, how effective it'll be. So anyway, so that's that. I will end and then on to Heather, who's going to talk to us about uh, research. Hi there. Uh, you didn't get to really get to know me at the beginning. So I'm Heather Tarnai-Feely. I'm the outpatient social worker in forensics, and I've been working with Dr. Fedorov for the last nine years. So I've had the pleasure. Um, what I do is just very briefly, um, I co-facilitate the groups with Dr. Fedorov, the outpatient psychotherapy groups. I write assessments for both uh, therapeutic and uh, court assessments. I do counseling and psychotherapy. Therapy. I help patients with various practical matters such as signing up for or applying for ODSP in Ontario Works and uh, I help them look for housing and that type of thing. So I'm very much on the clinical side of things. I've done a little bit of research. Uh, I've done a study on uh, attitudes, uh, looking at the attitudes of students uh, before and after they've come to our groups and we're going to be presenting that uh, hopefully in um, in Europe this uh, summer, so that'll be interesting to see. Okay, so I'm going to start by telling you just quickly who we uh, uh, serve, and uh, Lisa's already gone into quite a bit of that. So we look at men and women uh, who are over 18. We do do some adolescents as well, but the majority of our uh, patients are over 18. Some examples of sexual interests that we see are voyeurism, exhibitionism. Of course, our majority is pedophilia and child molesters. We do see some people with zoo or bestiality, sexual aggression, and other non-normative sexual interests. Um, most of our referrals uh, come from self-referral, of course, probation and parole, the court system, physicians, and other counselors or therapists in the community. I just had one person call me today, in fact, who is an uh, EAP worker um, who was asking about a patient of hers um, who had uh, non-normative sexual interests and wanted to know what services we had. So one of the things that I do is uh, give information and referrals. So fortunately, I was able to give that information to that patient um, and who will be getting a referral in as soon as possible. 
So our treatments offered, well, we have individual, couple, and family counseling, and that uh, usually for people to come and see me, they have to be referred by a physician in our uh, forensic program, um, and they usually have to ask for this. Now, usually uh, the docs uh, do medication management and sometimes have time to do a little bit of therapy with patients, but usually it's down to the psychological um, associates or myself or the psychologist who do most of the counseling. So again, I do individual couple and family counseling. I do group psychotherapy and I co-facilitate the groups and we have six groups that we're running right now. We have the mood group which uh, is for individuals with a, a problematic sexual interest and a mood disorder usually with depression and anxiety. Um, we also have a social skills group so this is for individuals who have or want to improve on their social skills and have a problematic sexual behavior. Uh, we also have the adult interest group and this group uh, interestingly enough got so big we had about 40 participants in this group so we had to cut it in half and now we have a group uh, running on Monday mornings and a group on Tuesday evenings so it gives people a chance either to come on Mondays or Tuesday evenings. Uh, we also have a resiliency group. This group is for anybody who has had either past abuse or who has undergone some type of trauma in their life and has a, sexual, a problematic sexual interest. Uh, we also have, and we found that this has been um, a problem for spouses especially. We had a spouses group to begin with, um, but we found that uh, this was difficult for spouses because they had to register as patients and they're not patients at all. It was their spouse who was the patient and they found it very difficult uh, to really uh, get uh, their feelings and so on out because they felt quite pressured being the patient. Um, so we decided to open the group up to friends and family and they come as guests of our patients and it gives them an opportunity to see what our patients do in the groups and it also gives an opportunity for friends and family to be able to talk about their um, unique uh, problems that they suffer as friends and families of sex offenders uh, or people with problematic sexual behaviors. Uh, there is a stigma that we found um, in itself for a spouse or partner of a person who has a sexual behavioral problem. Uh, and there weren't anywhere for people to go for support. So we offer this group now. Our groups run, um, they're open groups, so they're, uh, there's no set schedule for them. People can come and go as they please. Our groups are voluntary. Most people think that our groups are actually mandatory and uh, they have to come. But we always tell people that they are voluntary and most people come after probation or parole are over and will come for quite some time afterwards and find that the groups are very positive. Uh, groups run on Monday mornings uh, from 9 to 10.30 and uh, 10.30 to 11.30 and then we have three groups running on Tuesdays starting at 3 o'clock and they're an hour and a half each. So people really do have a chance to come and sit and talk about uh, how their week has been and then we have prescribed topics that we talk about in the second half of the group that has to do with that particular group. So for example in our mood group um, the first part of the group will be a check-in so people can talk about various different things that uh, uh, they had happen during the week or they can talk about a question that they want to pose the group and then the second part of the group the specific topic let's say if we were talking about the mood group we may talk about uh, how depression has affected your offending, for instance, or um, how is depression uh, affecting making friends, or that kind of thing. We also do uh, psychopharmacology, anti-androgen hormone therapy, and we have also a Chrysalis Day program. So what we found is that people who have had a hard time getting out during the day, if they're quite <coughs> apathetic, or even if people are on house arrest, uh, 
basically if they're awaiting sentencing or awaiting court uh, hearings, or even if after they've been sentenced but they're on house arrest and can't work. Um, the Chrysalis Day program has been very useful and very beneficial for these individuals. Uh, they can come during the day. The program runs four days a week. They offer uh, different types of groups. They have a leisure group. They have a social skills group. They have various different kinds of groups. And people can come during the, the day. And they uh, meet new people. They learn new skills. And uh, they can get out during the day, which is very beneficial. Um, one of the models that we use uh, in our groups, um, which is very uh, positive, is what is called the Good Lives model. And it focuses on working on building a positive, um, or on positive benchmarks in one's life, and like getting a job, uh, finding a partner, uh, building a support network, etc. And the goal is to graduate from our program, really. We really um, not push, but we really sort of um, encourage individuals to move past the Royal after they've done their time here. And we find that <coughs> they do. And people make friends, they build support networks. Uh, we've had um, patients get married, have children, um, find jobs, and move on from the program. And uh, some come back and say hello and, and are doing well. And uh, we are very happy with our success stories. So I also work with partnering agencies. And I would like to just name a few. Uh, we have the Circle of Supports and Accountability, or COSA. They work very closely with us and our federal um, patients. Uh, we work with the John Howard Society and the Elizabeth Fry Societies. They've been very helpful with our patients in finding jobs, in finding um, accommodations, uh, counseling. Uh, I just learned today that the John Howard Society also has started a group for family members and spouses as well, so that's been very helpful. It's actually a support group. Um, I also work a lot with Ontario Works, Ontario uh, Disability Support Program, uh, a Canada Pension Plan to try to get funding for individuals, um, Action Housing, Action Ejma to try to find housing for individuals, um, and probation and parole, just to name a few. Some of the obstacles facing some of our patients, and you've heard from some of the uh, young ladies here about the um, environment that uh, sex offenders and people with problematic um, sexual behaviors have. Uh, certainly criminal records, uh, and this is in respect to finding employment or having to travel for employment, and of course this goes with finding employment. A lot of jobs uh, require a criminal records check or will ask our patients if they have a criminal record and then won't hire them. So here you have a person who's coming out of jail who needs to find a job or employment and cannot find work. And it's not only discouraging, but they don't have enough money to even pay for rent. So this is very, very upsetting. Um, searching for housing, what we found now in the last few years, there's been a push for safe uh, housing. And so now landlords are asking for criminal records again pushing our patients into uh, neighborhoods which are not um, safe um, and again putting them back into that criminal element if we don't want them relapsing we want them to have safe and affordable housing so this has been quite a challenge uh, developing lasting friendships and establishing support networks again um, one of the main um, topics that come up in group is how am I to divulge my past if I've met a potential partner or if I'm meeting potential friends. So this is quite a concern. Uh, however, uh, people do divulge and do make friends and are able to make support networks. So this has been uh, very um, positive. And of course, the community acceptance. Remember, this is based on the belief that sex offenders cannot change and we have seen the proof that they do change. Uh, I'm just going to end with a case study. 
Um, I had a patient, Mr. A, we'll call him. He's a 65-year-old married man and a member of one of our groups. He was charged and convicted with, child, uh, with possession of child pornography. Mr. A was separated from his wife due to the charges, unfortunately. Um, but he's still in touch and he's very close to two of his three children. Um, one of the children is not speaking to him due to uh, past charges, unfortunately. Uh, Mr. A was referred to me due to housing needs, um, social and personal identification needs uh, also needed to be met. Um, he met with me, we did a housing search. He was able to find an apartment, fortunately. Uh, unfortunately, was in a bad neighborhood, but he's quite happy there. Um, uh, yeah, we were able to uh, correct the uh, identification and uh, let's see, uh, he was initially hesitant in meeting new people um, for fear that they would judge him in his past. However, I was able to um, get him connected with the Good Companion Center and he's now thriving there. He has made new friends, he is doing well and uh, is still coming to me. So there are success stories. And I'll end on that note. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, I'm going to finish off this session and give you a bit of an idea of what we do for research in the Sexual Behaviors Clinic. I'll try and make it pretty fast, because I know I'm the last talk tonight. Um, wow. I'm going to talk about several studies we have ongoing, but I'm not going to give you results just because that would take a really long time. <laughs> if you have specific questions for me, I might be able to answer them afterwards. So what exactly is research in the SVC? Well, we work very, very closely with the Sexual Behaviors Clinic, but we're actually the Forensic Research Unit. Um, it's the University of Ottawa Institute of Mental Health Research, so we are aff affiliated with the University of Ottawa but there are actually four different tiers of research within our unit. I'm only talking about SBC Sexual Behaviors Clinic tonight, and I have a lot to cover. So you can imagine that we have a lot going on all of the time, <laughs> as the other <laughs> researchers up there can attest to. Um, we are multidisciplinary, so there are those of us who our primary role is research, so basically all we do is research. Um, there are those of us who have research more as a secondary role, and then there are those who are not interested in research at all. So it, it's really what you're interested in, um, whether or not you're available to do it, if you have the time, that kind of thing. I myself am a research assistant and have been now for about seven years. We also do international collaborations. Um, Lisa talked a bit about this, so I don't want to rehash too much of this, but we have several people that we collaborate with all over the world and they have similar labs and similar like research setups at universities that we do. So why do we do research? Well, primarily to improve patient care. That's the number one. Um, a lot of our results directly inform how we treat patients, what we do with patients, how we do assessments, all that kind of thing. So that really is the most important part. Um, we are a teaching hospital, so of course it makes teaching relevant and exciting. So when we get students from various disciplines coming in to do, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, rotations, that kind of thing, they get a hands-on experience with the research. So they can see directly how what they're doing in research translates into practice. It also makes it easier that we have a very extensive database, so we consistently collect data. Every time somebody comes into the lab, has testing with Lisa, she asks them whether or not they're interested in having their information go into a research database. So later down the line, if we need it, we can use it. If they consent, which probably about 97% of people do, um, we have that information available to us. Um, our patients that attend group and that are in the SBC often want to participate in research. Lots of times they're very eager. I've had certain guys want to do the same study over and over again because they, they like it. Um, so it really helps that we have people that are very ambitious to help us out. And we have the resources. So we have a full unit upstairs. Um, not enough offices for the amount of people we have, of course, but we have the resources in order to do, to undertake large studies or several small studies simultaneously. So what influences the type of research we do? So much influences this. So um, a lot of times it's questions raised by patients and students alike. 
a lot of times these people are not so caught up in what we're doing so they they come out and say things and it's like well i never thought of that even though it's intuitive or it's obvious um testing the status quo it's always good to re reevaluate previous assumptions and i'll talk a little bit about a study later on um, where we're specifically doing that um, any type of new assessment measures or equipment questions regarding offender motivations, innovative ideas and topics that have not, been, not yet been explored. So forensic psychiatry is actually a relatively small part of the field of psychiatry. Um, and it's a relatively newish field, so there's still a lot of stuff to be covered. Quality of data, like I said, we have a lot of data. Um, and collaborations and joint projects. So when we travel for conferences or networking, we frequently will meet people who will say, hey, I'm interested in doing this. Do you guys have this kind of data? Would you wanna pair up and do something together? Funding sources, this is, these are just some of the organizations that have given us money in order to conduct research. Um, we just got three grants in the past year actually uh, from the UMRF, so we're doing pretty well with that. We're constantly applying to things and making sure that we get our piece of the pie so that we can continue on with what we're doing. Many of our projects, however, are not funded. So these are the smaller projects that don't involve recruiting participants, but they're the ones that will go and look at past data or they're a case series of like something strange that had went on. Um, these are easier to do on the side but they're not necessarily the priority. Knowledge translation. So this is just a fancy word to mean how do we disseminate our results? So how do we tell people and other professionals about our results? Um, I just looked at 2015 and so far 2016. So conference presentations nationally and internationally, Lisa talked a little bit about um, some upcoming travel. I counted from the beginning, we've done 22 conference presentations since January 2015. And those include panels, um, keynote speeches, research and progress talks, and workshops. Publication, um, I counted 20 since 2015. So these include journals. So these are academic journals. These are generally large studies with lots of numbers, lots of statistics. They take a long time to do, write up, and submit. We also do commentaries. Commentaries are somebody comes out with an article, sometimes people will be asked to write a commentary on that article. Lots of chapters, so chapters in textbooks, that kind of thing, encyclopedia articles, and technical papers. So there's a lot going on. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different types of studies we're, we're doing. We're doing a lot, but I try to make it so that it's kind of easy for you guys to understand. I'll skip this one because the next one's better. <laughs> okay, assessment research. So Lisa talked a lot about the phallometric assessment. We do a lot of research in terms of assessment, um, but some of the research is specifically stimuli research. So when Lisa was talking about the photographs, the mobile avatars, the real child voices splicing, that's research that's stimuli specific. Um, so basically I'm recruiting healthy controls from the community to undergo this testing. If anybody is interested, I'm still looking for people. Um, we pay. And we pay. <laughs> and men with a sexual interest in children that would want to undergo this study. The idea here is we want to make sure that this stimuli is effective at discriminating between men with a sexual interest in children and men without a sexual interest in children. Okay. Also, a lot of our international collaborations, it has to do with assessment type research. And then at the bottom is the VPP we mentioned before. We haven't yet started that, but um, we should be close for that. Um, other types of assessment research, we talked a little bit about fMRI testing that's going on with our group in Charleston and in Prague. So that's doing, like Lisa said, fMRI testing and phallometrics simultaneously to see whether or not that's an added bonus for assessment. We're looking at um, admitters and denier test results on phallometrics. So somebody comes in, they're either an admitter to the index offense or to the charges, or they deny the index offense or the charges. Do they have any differences on their phallometric test results? Is there anything that we need to be aware of when we're looking at their test results? Um, and phallometrics and visual reaction time. I don't think you, Lisa talked about visual reaction time, but it's essentially a computerized program. It's another way to measure sexual interest. So we were just looking at whether or not phallometrics or visual reaction time, either one has a better result. <coughs> Treatment research. So 
Um, CPIC and recidivism. So CPIC just means criminal records check. Um, this is a really, really huge study um, that we got a grant for actually recently. We have an agreement with the RCMP where they're sending us criminal records check from over 4,000 patients that have gone through our system. And this is so we can actually track the recidivism. So violent recidivism, sexual recidivism, not only that, but technical violations and also length of sentencing if they were sentenced. So this will be good to have so we can look seriously at our recidivism numbers. Um, and changes in phallometrics, Lisa talked a little bit about this, I think Natasha did too. So this is one of those ones where you challenge the status quo. So the idea is that um, men with sexual interest in children will always have sexual interest in children. Um, when we published this study, we realized that that wasn't the case. So in the very beginning at time one, um, they had a greater interest in children than in adults, but then at time two testing, it was the opposite. So there was a greater interest in adults than children. We're doing a prospective study right now where I'm actively recruiting people to continue that study. Special populations, I won't go into too much detail just in the interest of time. Um, this is research that's focused on a specific um, factor or a trait of uh, patients. So we do all kinds of this stuff. So oxytocin and psychopathy, that's looking at hormones related to um, level of psychopathy. Um, the relationship between psychopathy, pornography, and um, hands-on child sexual abuse. We have recently looked at risk, risk, risk measures in sex offenders with intellectual disabilities. So do these measures actually work in sex offenders that have lower IQ? And we've also looked at dangerous long-term offenders and compared them to the American um, equivalent. Qualitative research, Natasha gave a great rundown of um, some of the results of this, so I won't go into it too much, but qualitative research is more interested in the person as a whole, their experience, rather than the statistics and the numbers and that kind of thing. So it really is a lot about interviewing and understanding that person. And then other types of research. Um, SOR is sex offender registries, it's kind of a hot topic right now, so the lab works specifically on studies related to that, whether they are actually a good tool at preventing recidivism, and also comparing the Canadian system, which has closed registries, to the American system that has open registries. And changes of attitude, Heather also talked about this, this is her study, um, so looking at um, students and their peers, their attitudes of sex offender treatment prior to them attending group, and then after and prevention project. So this is our big highlight. I wanted to put a spotlight on this. Um, <laughs> Natasha talked a little bit about this. So this is a really innovative idea that we're really excited about. It comes from a combination of ideas. So the Stop It Now program, which is the helpline to prevent child sexual abuse. So having people that have an interest in children calling in to get resources prior to offending. Um, prevention Project Dunkelfeld, same thing, um, except the Dunkelfeld was more of a treatment um, program than the other one. Both of these programs view pedophilia as a public health concern, which is the way that we would like to go as well. So basically what we've done for this project is we've looked at the recommendations and the results between these two programs and designed our own way to do this. I should tell you also that Stop It Now, they saved, I think it was one year, they saved over a million dollars of the taxpayers' money because of their program. So what's the primary goal of our project? It's to prevent sexual offenses before they occur. So we want to encourage men who have a sexual interest in children to contact us so we can get them into the appropriate treatment or give them the appropriate resources before they go and commit a sexual offense. We also want to understand who these people are. So when we're doing research, the majority of the time, it's people who have gone through the criminal justice system. So we have a pretty good handle on what those people look like. But we don't know what the other people look like. So the people who have never offended who are living with this. We want to educate and provide resources to the public. So the Stop It Now program, part of the goal with that was to have the public call in as well to get information on this type of this type of phenomenon so they understood it better and that's a really big part of what we want to do. We also want to test the feasibility of this project. So it was successful in Europe. Um, it started off in the United States. It was successful there. So how well is it going to go over in Canada? 
so I'll give you an idea of how ours is going to be a little bit different. So a lot of them were actually phone lines where the person would call. Well, we've actually made it a website because we feel that it's more anonymous that way. So when you're browsing the internet, you come upon our website, you'll have our information as a clinic, you'll have a frequently asked questions, a lot of myths and misconceptions about sex offenders. Um, you will have the reporting requirements to say that we, you know, we are a legitimate organization and we're looking to help people. Then if the person decides they do want help and they want to contact us, there's an anonymous email form on the website. They fill that out. It comes to us in research. We will email them back, set up a time for them to come in. If they come in and meet with us, we'll talk about this is the study we're doing. This is why we're doing it. We'll talk about their particular situation and it'll be up to them whether or not they want to consent to participate in our research. They don't have to consent. We don't force people to do things against their will, um, but we can still offer resources if they don't consent. If they do consent, they fill out questionnaires. So these questionnaires have to do with loneliness, um, self-esteem, social isolation, that kind of thing. And then we let them know that if they want, they can undergo an assessment in the Sexual Behaviors Clinic Lab and a follow-up with Dr. Federoff. That's up to them if they want to do that, but regardless, after six months, we want to follow up with them and we want them to do the same questionnaires to see how they're feeling after they've actually talked to somebody. I should also note that um, both the Stop It Now and Dunkelfeld programs noted that their callers had um, significantly higher um, well-being after having contacted somebody and they felt a lot better about managing their behavior and managing how they feel. So to conclude, um, <laughs> we're really busy. Um, we have tons of volunteers and students and tons of ideas. So, um, And we're focusing strongly on prevention. Um, the whole Dunkelfeld, there, sorry, I keep calling it that, but the whole moving towards prevention project that we're doing. We do get people who will just call and say, I have this interest, I don't know what to do. We're not getting enough of those people. So those are the people that we're really trying to target. Um, also focusing on education why we're here tonight, and uh, our international collaborations for standardization, and that's the next big step for us. Thank you.